Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues here in the studio room in Brussels and also at uh, your computers or iPads or whatever, tablets at home, at work or wherever you are uh, uh, who are following us virtual. Uh, it's my pleasure really to welcome you to this uh, symposium which has been organized by Atlitos and uh, I'm very grateful that this is possible because it's about a new integrated 4-in-1 multi-organ support new therapeutic approach to multi-organ failure with this new therapy from Atlitos which is called ATVOS. We have two experts here on site who will share their uh, experiences with this uh, new innovative uh, system and obviously, in latest in the last uh, a year and a half during the uh, corona pandemic, and to be honest, we knew that before, we need urgently advanced extracorporeal organ support in over to um, support our patients even better and to bring more patients back to life. Um, in my own unit, so my name is Gerald Marx, I'm the head of the Department of Intensive Care at the University Hospital in Aachen. In my own department, you will hear from um, Dr. Karasimos in a few minutes about that. We have um, collected now really some experiences with this uh, new uh, adverse therapy and, um, well, when um, somebody comes with a new technology, uh, we are always a little bit in doubt, and I think this is correct uh, to be not over fascinated, uh, but um, especially in the treatment of uh, severe uh, ECMO COVID-19 patients, I've seen very good results using this technology, and uh, therefore I think it's worthwhile to share expertise, to learn more, and um, to discuss this um, after the two presentations. Well, we start with um, Dr. Evangelos Karasimos from Aachen in Germany. He is an um, intensivist. He is, in, um, he is from his background uh, twofold. He is an anesthetist and he is an internal medicine colleague. And from both legs, he made his special degree of intensive care in Germany. So he's sort of one of the very few persons I, I personally know in Germany we have this uh, really a large uh, um, background and uh, therefore he is the right person to talk about the clinical results and therapy protocol in a 75 bed medical ICU in Germany. Dr. Rasimus, please. Dear Professor Marx, thanks for the introduction. Dear Professor Fuhrmann, dear colleagues, clinical results and therapy protocol for the adverse device in a post-operative setting. The department I work in consists of several surgical and not medical ICUs, as erroneously mentioned in the title of the talk. This will be the subject of the following lecture. Another description for the talk would be searching for the jack of all trades. This is my conflict of interest. I would like to briefly guide you through the agenda. At first, I will present you the definition of ATWAS, which is followed by a few words about the history of dialysis. After that, Albumin dialysis is explained and the differences in comparison to ATVOS are shown. This is followed by indications, fields of application and therapeutic possibilities. And then I will present you the standard operating procedure of our department. Finally, I would like to illustrate the aforementioned with some of our clinical data. The ATVOS device, this is an acronym for Advanced Organ Support, provides multi-organ support for the liver, lung, kidneys, and furthermore, rapid correction of the acid-base balance. In contrast to conventional dialysis methods, which only eliminate water-soluble toxins, the addition of albumin can also remove protein-bound hepato- and nephrotoxins. In addition to that, the possibility to control the dialysis pH with the aid of a separate acid and base circuit makes the elimination of CO2 possible. Some words to the history. Renal dialysis was invented in 1942 by Dr. Kolf. He wrapped cellophane, that most of you know as wrapping from sausages, around a washing drum, as you can see here, and conducted the patient's blood through this membrane 
The dialysate in the tub then absorbs the toxins from the blood. Very simple, but effective. Here again, illustrated in the cartoon, the patient blood flows separated through a semi-permeable membrane along the dialysate, which is refined water, and the toxins are filtered off through differences in concentration. Albumin dialysis itself was invented in 1995, evoked by patients with Morbus Wilson, a metabolic disorder and the copper metabolism. This resulted in various manifestations of different organ systems like renal failure, pancreatitis, hemolytic anemia, lactic acidosis, hepatic encephalopathy, hepatitis, circulatory failure, and thrombocytopenia. Here one can see the simple operating principle of SPAD. It consists of a blood circuit with hemodialyzer, which is perfused with albumin so that toxins can bound and be eliminated. The limitations of this method were that the albumin could only be, uh, be used once and a high dialysate flow was not possible. And this um, resulted in a reduced efficiency of the detox detoxification and um, a very high cost due to the high albumin consumption. The ATVOS device is an evolution of this principle. It consists of a blood circuit with a dialyzer and a dialysate circuit with albumin, whereby protein-bound toxins can be eliminated. In the dialysate circuit, um, so acid and sodium hydroxide is um, added. The change in the pH, which you can see here, resulted in changing the protein structure so that the albumin toxin bond is broken and the toxins can be filtered off. Finally, the albumin is then uh, um, brought back together and restituted and thus can absorb again toxins. So there is a continuous detoxification with low albumin use. Last but not least, ADVOS also functions as normal dialysis, and urinary toxins can also be removed. So in theory, we are getting close to the jack of all trades. In addition to that, the increase of the dialysate pH in the ADVOS circuit and the reduction of bicarbonate concentration in the dialysate results in the removal of bicarbonate and protons from the blood. As you can see in the henderson hasselbalch equation, um, the effect is the reduction of CO2 concentration and increase of the pH in the blood. The ADVOS dialysis can remove up to 5 millimoles CO2 per minute, and that is approximately half of the production of a resting person. One can make use of it in order to eliminate CO2. Here you see the three main determinants of CO2 removal, namely blood flow, pH, and bicarbonate concentration. The higher the blood flow, the higher the pH, and the lower the bicarbonate in the dialysate, the more effective is the CO2 removal. Now let's take a look at acidosis. Focusing on this is an important aspect in this field because the liver is the second uh, most important organ in acid-base balance. You see, it can detoxify 2,000 millimol acid per day. Of course, the lungs and kidneys play also an important role in this field. In this study of my co-speaker, Professor Fuhrmann, one can see that in patients with acidosis, an increase in um, mortality already begins in the normal range. And you see that 100% of patients die at, a, uh, at an arterial pH lower than 7.1. Consequently, pH is an expression of the severity of the disease. So the aim is normalization of the pH in the upper normal range because of the lowest mortality there. The background is the actual pH of the uh, liver is lower than the arterial value that we measure since two-thirds of the blood supplying the liver comes from the intestine. Now let's take a look at the classification of individual organ failures in ICU. Here, for instance, the definition of kidney failure. As one can see, 
from the Aiken or rifle classification, creatinine and diuresis are used here as parameters. In analogy to that, classification of lung failure, you use the O2 content in the blood. Now focusing on liver failure shows a more complex situation. You can see that one fourth of the patients have a secondary liver failure presenting as cholestatic or hypoxic hepatitis. And only a negligibly small proportion show an acute and chronic or even primary acute uh, liver failure. Unfortunately, liver failure in contrast to the aforementioned kidney and lung failure cannot be classified using the laboratory findings alone. Therefore, multi-organ failure, which has a high proportion in ICU, as you can see here, must also be taken into account. This can be seen here very clearly, the so-called hepatic phenotype, that is, the coincidence of liver and kidney failure. This may not be the most common type, but it has the highest mortality rate in ICU of almost 40%. This reinforces the idea of the need of early therapeutic intervention, even more prognostic markers reach commonly accepted thresholds. Speaking of acting early or of the time factor, one can see that if acidosis is compensated early, the patient's survival increases significantly. Let's take some words on SOFA score. SOFA-score has proven itself as an assessment tool for the severity and the resulting mortality of multiple organ failure. Mortality increases almost linearly. I will show you this in the graph. From a SOFA-score from 7, which equals a predicted mortality of 20%, up to 18, with a mortality of nearly 80%. Every additional point of the SOFA-score in this area increases the mortality by 3 to 6%. Here again, illustrated in a graph, one can see in the right area that the mortality rate is so high that any therapeutic intervention will hardly make any difference in the outcome of the patient. In analogy to that is the situation here on the left side with the low SOFA scores and low mortalities. Therefore, we want to concentrate on this green area. There is a relevant severity of disease with corresponding mortality. For instance, when you take a SOFA score of 10, which is equivalent to a predicted mortality of 40%. And this is the field of intervention where we think that an intervention would have the greatest noticeable effect. So for the effective use of the ATVOS, there should be at least two organ failures. With three organ affected, we will have the maximum mortality. Um, so according to that, if there is liver failure and another organ dysfunction that causes respiratory, metabolic, or mixed acidosis requiring treatment, the ATVOS therapy should be considered at an early stage. This is also reflected in our um, algorithm that we use in our department. You see, patients need to provide a liver failure, mainly secondary liver failure, which is depicted as hypoxic or cholestatic hepatitis, which we see with a bilirubin of greater than 8 and or an ASDLT level which is 20-fold higher than the normal range. In addition to that, we need the patient to present another organ dysfunction, usually kidney or lung dysfunction. This is depicted in a metabolic or respiratory or mixed acidosis seen in a pH lower than 7.3. And finally, we need this severity of disease with a predicted uh, mortality, and which is depicted in a SOFA score greater than 10. If all these three entities come together, we in our department consider the use of ATROS. As mentioned in my agenda, I would now like to present some of our un unpublished data. You can see that we mainly treated surgical and now in the COVID pandemic, also pneumological patient population. We had 18 patients, 16 male to female, average age was 56 years, length of hospitalization before ATVOS was 24 days, the length of ICU stay was uh, um, average 20 days. They had a lab melt of around 27, which equals to a predicted three month mortality of about 38%. The mortality rate was 66%. 
And if we exclude five patients who, who were already moribund and were treated with ATWAS as an ultima ratio intervention, died within a few hours, the rate is adjusted to 50%. And that means that our algorithm allowed us to identify and select exactly these patients in the certain state of disease severity and mortality that we wanted to investigate and treat. Here you see the duration of treatment. It ranged from a minimum of one up to 13 treatments. The treatment is about 24 hours. The average duration was 4.3 days. And um, you see here an outlier peak, and these were the, the five patients who were already in the moribund state when treated with ATWAS and induced this outlier peak. So five of six patients with only one day treatment died during the first uh, treatment. Therefore, we, we made this uh, anal uh, analysis without this patient. Here you can see all the demographic data of our patients summarized uh, in a chart. The indications in our department were acute and chronic liver failure, one patient. Cholestatic hepatitis, nine patients. Hypoxic hepatitis, five patients. And CO2 elimination during the pandemic, seven patients. So we can look back at a cumulative um, number of 82 treatments. So the main indications in our department, secondary liver failure and CO2 elimination. First of all, let me show you the effect on urinary toxins. You can see that urea value decreases very quickly in all patients. The same applies to creatinine as a further meaningful retention parameter. Almost every graph drops showing a relevant clearance of creatinine. Here in the values, before ATWAS, we have a urea of 79. Day one during ATWAS, 36, highly significant. Creatinine before ATWAS, 1.87. Day one during ATWAS, 1.06, also significant. So we have a significant clearance, but this is not what makes the ATWAS device unique. If you now take a look at the bilirubin elimination, which is considered a surrogate parameter for liver clearance, you also see an apparent drop in the values showing a good elimination. Why treat high bilirubin, in particular in cholestatic hepatitis? It is because of the so-called transporter problem. If liver function is going down, there is a rapid loss of the transporters, which are highly susceptible to hypoxic stress. And these transporters are responsible for the excretion of the bile. So if the bilirubin level rises, it reflects the loss of liver function. Here the, the clear data. Before ATWAS, we had a bilirubin of 11.36. On day one, it was reduced to 9.55. And at the end of the ATWAS treatment, you remember about four days, we had a bilirubin level of 7.68, which was a significant reduce. So if the five patients who died within the first hours of ATWAS therapy are excluded from the analysis, then the reduction is significant even after one day. You see here, before ATWAS, 14.6. Day one, uh, during ATWAS, 11.74. So it shows ATWAS is a highly effective liver dialysis. Now let's move on to the very interesting indication of decarboxylation. Here the data are rather inconclusive. One can identify patients in whom CO2 can be eliminated very quickly and effectively, especially those in whom one started at high CO2 levels, like this one, or this one, but there are also patients in whom the effect is not so clear, like this one or this one. This is also reflected in the data I present you. Before ATWAS, CO2 was 63 millimeter of mercury. Day one during ATWAS, 59. Day two during ATWAS, 60. No change at all. In order to find an explanation here, again, as a reminder, the determinants for CO2 removal. You remember blood flow, pH, and bicarbonate concentration. One reason for our, our inconclusive data could be that in the beginning of our treatments, we did not increase the blood flow up to the highest amount of 400 milliliters per minute, and we did not dialyze against a zero bicarbonate. So this could be two factors to explain that. 
With pH compensation, however, we see that normalization can be achieved very quickly. Before Atwas, you see a pH of 7.28, and on day one during Atwas therapy, um, it's just a normal range of 7.41. In analogy to this, we see the concomitant increase in bicarbonate. Before Atwas, 28. Day one during Atwas, 34.9, highly significant. So one can conclude that Atwas can provide a quick and effective correction of the metabolic situation. If you now take a look at CO2 and acidosis in terms of mortality, you will see that uh, hypercapnic acidosis and compensated hypercapnia are associated with increased hospital mortality, prolonged ICU stay, and longer length of stay in the hospital. A progressive increase in mortality is associated with increasing CO2 up to 65 millimeters of mercury, after which mortality reaches a plateau. So we have some kind of threshold of CO2 level. Now looking at acidosis and here at the bicarbonate as surrogate parameter, one notices that in the range in between 30, uh, 23 and 34, the same mortality is present with a nadir at the bicarbonate level of 30. Furthermore, one can see that the mortality due to acidosis is much higher than with alkalosis. So again, here there are some kind of target values. Until now, data on the effect on mortality of patients treated with Athos are only available from registries but still they're quite promising. Here you see 160 patients were analyzed for mortality. The expected mortality uh, using SOFA would be 80%. The 28 mortality in this registry was 60%. Here again, shown in graphical way, the better survival rate for treated patients in comparison to the expected value. Finally, as initially announced, a few case studies to illustrate the aforementioned what's happening in the practical use of the atlas in reality. So I show you this patient. It's a 35-year-old patient with ECMO and left ventricular cyst device after revision, revision surgery of biological aortic valve replacement. The patient suffered of holostatic hepatitis and persistent of hypercapnia. We used the atlas device here for ECMO bridging. So after Stopping the ECMO here, we saw a relevant rise in CO2 level. So Atwas was initiated at this time point with some kind of latency, but almost instantly CO2 could be reduced and the metabolic situation could be controlled. Finally, we achieved a successful weaning of the patient, which could be transferred from the hospital. Next, I will present you a COVID patient, 60 years old with COVID ARDS, he already had one turn of ECMO, then he had to relapse, and now we used ATVOS for decarboxylation. At very high CO2 levels, ATVOS was initiated and proved very effective in both decarboxylation and pH restitution. Finally, this patient died due to um, a result of therapy limitation, but nevertheless, it shows that the therapy was effective. Another patient with COVID RDS from the first wave, 50 year, uh, 51 years old. He also had one turn of ECMO, then a relapse, and now we decided to use Atvos for CO2 elimination. In this patient, we, sh we see that he initially was quite dependent from Atvos. After starting the Atvos device, um, CO2 and metabolic situation could be controlled sufficiently. But then due to a technical problem, the Atwas had to be paused, and you see that instantly CO2 is rising again, and it could only be managed after a new machine was started. This patient finally also um, was successful weaned and transferred to rehab. Another 51-year-old patient with COVID RDS from the second wave. He also had a condition after ECMO, a relapse, then a second turn of ECMO, which we seldomly do. And then we were very cautious and uh, wanted not to, to explant the ECMO uh, right now, and then tried with the Atwas device to 
performed the ECMO weaning, ECMO bridging. After initiating ATWOS, as you can see here, CO2 levels and metabolic situation could be kept in the same range as before under ECMO therapy. What is impressive in, uh, from my point of view is when you look at here, the fact that the breathing load of the patient could be reduced from over 20 liters per minute here to lowest of 11 liters, which is highly relevant. We could reduce the breathing load nearly to 50%. This patient also was successful weaned, transferred to rehab, and is back to life again. The last two slides show again very strikingly the clinical effect of ATVOS. You can see here, although high CO2 levels persist, the pH is compensated, normalized very quickly. And this is reflected in the catecholamine requirement, which goes down. Here, even more clearly and sustainably than in the previous example, high CO2 level, diminished pH is rising to the normal level, and concomitantly, catecholamine requirement is decreasing dramatically. With this, I want to finish my talk and draw the following conclusion. Atwas is working effectively as renal and liver dialysis. It can fastly compensate acidosis, and it also can accelerate CO2 elimination. Atwas seems to have a potentially positive influence on mortality, which brings us as physicians a little closer to our goal. And then there's still the question of being the jack of all trades. The future and further investigations will show if the Atlas device can fulfill this expectation. This brings me to the end of my remarks, and I uh, thank you for the attention. I will be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Karasimos, for sharing your experience and data and uh, your clear remarks on the ATVOS system. Um, maybe I just uh, really um, uh, add that uh, I was impressed by this <clears throat> uh, device during the, the COVID pandemic because we had several patients, really it was difficult to wean them from ECMO and bridging with uh, the ATVOS uh, therapy. We were able to wean them completely uh, and then bring them to our weaning unit. So this was on several occasions and obviously very effective. Are there any questions from the floor? Then um, maybe I start. Um, in respect to liver dialysis, quite often we are confronted with the um, argument that the liver dialysis is basically just a correction of bilirubin in terms of lab values, but not of, in terms of organ dysfunction. So when we stop therapy, bilirubin rises again. So what, what is your experience with the adverse therapy? So in, in the beginning, um, I, as I mentioned, it is the transporter problem. The, the, these transporters need to be restituted again, and uh, it is the time that we need the, the liver to recover. And um, with this uh, therapy that it's not ongoing, we do it on a 24-hour uh, uh, therapy, we, we can diminish it and we see as long, uh, the longer the therapy goes, we, we don't need uh, so many um, repeatants of the, um, of the interventions. And uh, as we showed, bilirubin is, uh, is not only a lab value, it is, uh, um, um, also shows the kind of um, disease and also kind of mortality. So um, our surgical colleagues often um, say, oh, okay, we make the bilirubin nice, but you also do a, a high benefit for your patient and uh, help to recover the patient. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, we didn't see um, any differences in this. Yeah, I think as it works, like uh, most of the, um, uh, the antibiotics uh, are used also in dialysis, we uh, use the same um, dosages as we use in, um, in hemodialysis. 
and uh, until now we didn't see um, same effects like with the, the uh, absorption devices, for instance. Good question. Yes, please. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, the AST ALT level must be high enough. And in hypoxic hepatitis, you have the AST or ALT elevated. Um, and it's just, we wanted to start, as Professor Marx uh, said, we found this an interesting device, and we wanted to start and bring it in therapy in our clinic. And um, so we had to, to take a look um, at, at the patients we see. Usually I work in a cardiothoracic surgery unit and we saw a lot of patients with, with this elevated um, values. And then um, we put all the information together and these are the, the first, now we have nearly 100 uh, therapies uh, uh, done. And we see that we, we try, uh, we find the exact patients to identify uh, which most of them um, profit from this uh, therapeutic intervention. Um, so I think it was the first, first kind of uh, algorithm. Maybe we, we can readapt it or make it more, more sp specialized or sufficient for, for our um, future patients. Yeah, maybe one, one additional comment. I think um, Dr. Kasmus uh, clearly showed that um, it is very important to start not too late, so that this is sort of a last given life. Uh, um, but, I mean, we, we know this from, from many uh, therapies that in the beginning, usually you start in the patients where you say, well, just have a go and uh, we, we cannot lose anything else. But this is obviously then too late, so this is not uh, worthwhile. So it's, it's very important to have clear standard operating procedures for the uh, start of the therapy to enable the patient or the, the device to uh, benefit for the patient. Good. Time is up. Thank you once again for sharing your expertise and data and a very nice presentation. Then now it's my pleasure to ask Professor Valentin Fuhrmann from uh, Duisburg uh, to give his uh, lecture. Uh, Professor Fuhrmann is uh, a gastroenterologist and he is the head of the Department of Internal Medicine in Duisburg, but he also um, um, have made experiences with the ADVOS device at the University Hospital in Hamburg, so uh, University of Eppendorf. And he will give us insights about ADVOS therapy, current medical evidence, and indications. Thank you ever so much. Dr. Marx, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm very happy to uh, uh, talk about uh, our experiences. So um, we started to work back in, I think, 2015 uh, uh, in, in Hamburg at the Department of Intensive Care Medicine. And uh, at the time, uh, my, my focus was always liver diseases, also extracorporeal therapies. So a big issue was uh, on organ failure and, and type of organ failure. And, and this is the data that I'm now presenting to you. Um, this is a comparison of uh, kind of organ failures over the time between 2002 and 2012, two big uh, studies uh, assessed the kind of organ failure in 2002. Liver failure was present in about 3% of patients on ICU admission and uh, uh, in 2012 it was already present in up to 10% and furthermore uh, uh, during the whole course of the ICU stay liver failure was in 2012 already present in uh, up to 20%. That means every fifth of our patients that we treat has any kind of liver failure. Uh, uh, so this is daily clinical practice. So as mentioned previously, we have different kinds of liver failure. The typical cirrhotic patients, acute and chronic liver failure represents, depending on the kind of department, one to up to 5% of our critical patients and is dependent on the severity of acute and chronic liver failure, dependent on the number of organ failures, the failing organs, uh, short term mortality up to 80 90 percent within 28 days. Um, these patients can be available for liver transplant evaluation. A primary acute liver failure, the, the 
patient with acute viral hepatitis B, with paracetamol intoxication, uh, cases like that, uh, as an extremely rare uh, condition and are present less than 10 cases per million persons per year with, with decreasing mortality rates. In the meantime, it's 20% or even less within one year. The other side, as mentioned previously, the secondary acquired liver failures, they are very frequently, on the cardiothoracic VAD, you frequently see the hypoxic liver injury, a massive, in massive increase of immunotransferase levels present up to 10 to 15% of the patient with also quite high mortality rates, up to 60%, no liver transplant indication. The cholesteatic liver injury following sepsis, following ARDS, following abdominal surgery or whatever is the most common cause of liver injury, liver failure up to 20 or 30%, also with increased mortality rates and no option for liver transplantation. Liver failure is on stereotype, on, on classical picture of multi-organ failure and um, uh, up to 70% of patients uh, with liver failure suffer from acute kidney injury, 10 to 30% suffer from ARDS, more than 50% of the ICU are vasopressor dependent, 50 to 100% suffer from hepatic encephalopathy and uh, 40 to 70% from severe coagulopathy. And furthermore, as also uh, provided previously, severe uh, acid Demia, acidemia is present in more than half of the patients on ICU admission associated with dramatically increased mortality rates. This is my uh, uh, recent uh, data that we assessed in Hamburg, uh, 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 liver failure in COVID patients, um, at least in our critical patients in Hamburg, we uh, observed also up to 30% of patients with COVID uh, pneumonia and ARDS that were treated at the intensive care unit suffer from severe liver injury. Many risk factors on the one hand, the severity of disease illustrated by the subscore, otherwise also the degree of viremia that was an independent significant predictor of new onset of liver failure in this population. Um, severity of organ failure is always associated with outcome. Uh, here illustrate that patients with acute and chronic liver failure, three or more failing organs, dramatically increased mortality rates. But if it's possible to stabilize this patient, as mentioned already by Professor Marx, early, uh, we can improve outcome dramatically. And also in patients with acute and chronic liver failure, cirrhotics, the most severe ill patients with liver diseases, have a reversibility of ACLF of 35 up to 45 percent within the first week if we initiate treatment immediately and the less progressive the organ failure is when we start treatment, uh, the better the outcome. Um, therefore, we should initiate treatment early and what can we do in patients with liver failure? On the one hand, prevention is the best at the ICU, it's usually too late, but on the other hand, we have bundles of care, medical therapies, extracorporeal therapies and in some circumstances, the opportunity of liver transplantation. I will focus now on the extracorporeal therapies and uh, uh, just give a short overview on uh, renal replacement therapies. Um, usually we have the uh, absolute indications that is massive acidosis, severe electrolyte disturbance, hyperkalemia, clinical significant volume overload, refractory to other therapies, and uremia. Several relative indications like liver disease patients, hepatic encephalopathy, volume overload that is refractory uh, or that does not improve with therapeutic measures, um, progressive multi-organ failure and so on. What can we expect from renal replacement therapy? We can expect elimination of water substances, volume regulation and regulation of acid base hemostasis. Um, we use it during daily clinical practice, but the only evidence that we have from renal replacement therapy in patients with liver diseases are retrospective case series. Yeah, but what we see here is um, that patients, to summarize, is have in 60 to 70 percent acute kidney injury, independent of the kind of liver failure. If it's acute, acute and chronic, or secondary acute liver failure, and 30 to 40 percent require extracorporeal therapies, usually renal replacement therapy. So, what is the rationale for artificial liver support? It's an add on. It's the opportunities that a conventional renal replacement therapy offers in addition to clearance of albumin bound toxins, and it was frequently used, or was used, and is used as bridge to recovery or liver transplantation. They cannot replace the liver, importantly, but it's more an advanced dialysis with special benefits if you, if you 
accept this term. So what are the proven clinical benefits of albumin dialysis? There are several randomized control studies that demonstrated that there's improvement of systemic and portal hemodynamics using albumin dialysis in patients with liver failure in acute and acute and chronic. Furthermore, there's the only randomized control study of an extracorporeal device that, that provides evidence that albumin dialysis improves hepatic encephalopathy using the MARS system and they can be used for pruritus and jaundice, uh, contributing to improvement. In addition to effects of conventional renal replacement therapies. The re uh, most recent meta-analysis assessing all available data of um, um, extracorporeal therapies in patients with liver disease was published last year in intensive care medicine and uh, was able to demonstrate that there are 25 randomized control studies in this field, all of them treating people, patients with liver support devices. There's no single randomized control study assessing conventional renal replacement therapy in patients with liver diseases. And some, some are positive, some are negative. Overall, there is um, a, a significant uh, sign for improvement in patients that received liver support devices. The number needed to improve survival was 16 in the patients with acute and chronic liver failure and 22 in patients with acute liver failure. So this is not the monster convincing evidence that we should use it in daily clinic practice, but I think it's a strong sign that it makes sense that we are using these devices and at least we have this kind of evidence that we do not have in patients with renal replacement therapy. Um, uh, we wrote an editorial uh, and summarized the current status regarding extracorporeal therapies in liver diseases and um, uh, I think importantly, um, um, Although we usually use renal replacement therapies, there's no evidence that proves in randomized controlled trials that, 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 that the patient's benefits. We urgently need these studies. Yeah? On the other hand, we have liver support therapies. The artificial ones are approved that we, in, in, in many countries, as, as in Germany, for instance. Um, however, it's not frequently used because it's not feasible in clinical practice. Preparation is time maybe too long. Maybe it's not in everybody's mind. Um, uh, but these are the opportunities that we have. In addition, we can use plasma exchange. Um, for sure, we should consider the issues that were also already discussed previously, like um, um, uh, pharmacokinetics, alterations, uh, anticoagulation, and so on. There are a lot of issues that we, where we still have to learn a lot in this uh, uh, extremely challenging patient population. But it's feasible. And importantly, we should repeatedly reassess the current status of the patient. These are very sick patients. We can help a lot of them, but not everybody. And we should talk with the patient, with the relatives, with the team concerning the, the progression that the patient is doing or that he does not make. Okay, Atos, you heard already a lot, so I will maybe skip some of the slides, not to repeat uh, uh, some issues that you heard already. Atos is a new albumin dialysis device that is approved in the European Union for treatment of kidney and or liver failure. And it has, as mentioned previously, extended therapeutic options, elimination of water-soluble substances, elimination of protein-bound substances, advanced regulation of acid-base hemostasis, and also individualized uh, regulation of temperature. You know, you are already familiar with this device, semipermeable membrane, albumin uh, circuits, um, and uh, alterations of the space status in subcircuits. So we'll skip this. Um, and this summarizes uh, the effects of uh, the albumin dialysis regarding elimination of water soluble and protein bound substances in different compared to other devices, compared to the Mars and Prometheus systems, and it's quite comparable. You can expect that, for instance, regarding bilirubin, about 20 to 30 percent of bilirubin are eliminated per treatment session in patients with um, um, severe hyperbilirubinemia. Our data from Hamburg could demonstrate that the higher the bilirubin levels were, the more effective the elimination of bilirubin was. The lower they were, the less impact on reduction of bilirubin could be achieved. Um, this is the, the screen, a touch screen, the interface of the device. So it's a lot of things are quite comparable to regular uh, 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 dialysis devices. Blood flow rate, uh, uh, you can adjust uh, uh, the, 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 in this case it's called concentra concentration flow, but it's comparable to 
dire side flow maybe um, ultra filtration rate but but what is different is that you can adjust mainly the pH during the treatment on the individual individual basis and um, this was uh, when I started treatment this was two practice analysis that we made 2015 or 16 where we saw quite impressive what this device is able to do the left one um, um, is a venous blockers analysis taken from the patient with blood that is transferred to the device, to the Atos device. You see the patient is really ill, suffers from severe metabolic acidosis, uh, is venous blood, so he has um, slightly elevated CO2, uh, pH 7, 1.4, almost 4, uh, strongly declined base excess, and that's the, the, the blood that is we infused from the device to the patient, the pH uh, almost eight, um, carbon dioxide strongly reduced and base excess dramatically altered. So this device can really, in extreme settings as mentioned up there, um, um, alter the acid base status of the patient in addition to elimination or reduction of bilirubin levels. Yeah, so this is really possible if it's necessary, you can adjust and also achieve as demonstrated previously uh, these alterations. Um, uh, it was already mentioned, so I will be short here. CO2 removal is uh, achieved by high dialysate pH and low bicarbonate in the dialysate um, due to concentration of bicarbonate, uh, due to lower concentration of bicarbonate and protons in the dialysate. Um, um, the uh, 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 carbon dioxide can be removed from the blood in the dialysate and, and, and therefore uh, a decline of uh, CO2 is possible. And in an experimental setting, it was able, in ideal conditions that can usually not be achieved in patients uh, during daily clinical routine, um, and it was possible to remove experimental 5 millimole carbon dioxide per minute. That's an extreme uh, potential. Uh, uh, here you see that uh, extreme respiratory acidosis could be compensated by the device compared to conventional dialysis therapy where severe acidosis occurred. Um, this is our first clinical experience from Hamburg. I think uh, uh, we, we had here different patient populations where the subpopulation of um, uh, ARDS and also respiratory acidosis, where it was possible in the first treatment session to improve the pH and also to, to improve the carbon dioxide levels. And as mentioned uh, previously by Dr. Karasimos, also we observed that the blood flow rate and the pH setting were able to adjust according to the clinical uh, relevance uh, the, 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 to achieve our, our acid-based goals. Um, recently, uh, colleagues from Munich published a case series of patients with atlas in patients with severe COVID pneumonia that had already prone position. Um, and they also observed a really effective decarboxylation with, with the device from average uh, almost 50 milliliters per minute uh, 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 continuous CO2 removal. So that's really a lot that's uh, compared to to other devices like Prisma Lung, A Lung, quite comparable by the Atmos device with blood flow rates from two to 300 milliliters per minute via a conventional hemodialysis catheter. Um, going back to our data from Hamburg, uh, our case series, what did we observe in our mixed population? We observed on the one hand an improvement of uh, an effective detoxification, reduction of creatinine, bilirubin, and also arterial ammonia. It's important for hepatic encephalopathy in our population. Uh, we observed an improvement of acidosis and also hypercapnia, an almost but not statistically significant trend of reduction of the peak pressure and the reduction of the, uh, the tidal vol uh, volume was achieved and, um, uh, uh, and the hemodynamics improved in our population. I think that is mainly the consequence due to improvement of the acid base status. Of this really very sick patients, they had a median SOFA score, I think, of 15. So really sick, sick patients, five to, uh, four to five organ failure well, well, that was the average in our population. Anticoagulation, you can use Conventional heparin, unfortunate heparin, we used also sometimes antithrombin-3, but mostly in the last time we only used original citrate anticoagulation and it works very fine. I would not recommend using no anticoagulation. We had uh, three uh, treatment sessions where there was very short-term clotting, so in general I would not recommend 
using no anticoagulation extracorporeal therapies. So this is the summary of, of our experiences in Hamburg. So far, even 17, sorry, I said 15, 17. Um, mean, mean treatment duration, 70 hours, 17 hours uh, uh, per, per treatment, number of sessions, two, median ICU length of stay, uh, nine. And this is a very sick patient with expected mortality up to 80%. And we observed a 20-day survival rate of 50% and an 80-day survival of almost 40%. Uh, that means 60% uh, did not survive. That's quite a quite promising uh, experience that we collect here. In the meantime, other centers also published already data. This is data from, from Jena. They observed that the survival in their patients improved if they had a higher number of treatment sessions. Patients that were treated four times or even higher, uh, even more, uh, had improved survival compared to patients that had less than four treatment sessions. And this is, in, is it comparable to the finding that was made in a uh, 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 meta-analysis with the MARS system, the more frequent you treat the patients, the better the outcome. Um, this is also an, an interesting recent publication from colleagues from Mainz that um, didn't use the ATO system at the intensive care unit. This was a nephrologist that uses it as intermittent uh, extracorporeal therapy in patients with acute and chronic liver failure outside of intensive care unit. And also here they had quite promising, interesting results. It works also for eight hour treatment session with uh, decline of uh, bilirubin and creatinine, uh, stable conditions. And they had a post hoc comparison to patients with cirrhosis that are sick with fibrocryo dialysis and received conventional hemodialysis, the patients with the ATO system had trend for better outcome compared to hemodialysis, but this is only a retrospective comparison and no randomized control trial for sure. Um, finally, we uh, uh, assessed uh, the first experiences of ATOS in a multicentric registry. Uh, in the first uh, assessment, four centers participated, Hamburg uh, uh, University, uh, University, Essen University, Mainz, and, and uh, Hospital Weiden in, in Bavaria. Um, and uh, these patients were quite comparable ill, as mentioned previously, severe multi-organ failure, mixture of patients with chronic pre-existing liver disease or acute liver dysfunction in injury. Um, an average patient received three treatment sessions for also 17 hours per treatment session. Atlas is approved to a maximum of 24 hours per treatment session. And um, yeah, blood flow rate 120 milliliters per minute. Um, and during the uh, treatment, there was a significant improvement of bilirubin, the creatinine uh, parameters improved, acid base status improved. This was quite, oh, sorry, quite comparable to the findings that we made in other studies. Um, I think this is a very important slide. We didn't talk about adverse events yet. Yeah? In Taking together almost 430 treatment sessions um, with the ATOS device, 79 adverse events occurred, but only 13 were related to the device. And the, the, the adverse event related to the device was clotting. Yeah? That means uh, only 3% of our treatment sessions had a device related adverse event, otherwise, there were catheter problems, uh, uh, infection, uh, but not uh, device related adverse events. The outcome, as mentioned by, by Dr. Rasimus, also we observed the same here. Um, the outcome was better in a range between maybe so far, I would not say 10, maybe from seven up to, 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 to 15, 14, 15, this range, and, and, and in the higher group from, from, from 12 to 20, outcome was, more, was, was worse. So I think it's really important to discuss and to learn from every published paper how we could adjust the, the, the range of patients that should be included in the study. We should not start too early, but we should not start too late. Um, and to find the golden middle is always the most difficult issue. Um, so, from my point of view, which patient should be treated for this ATVOS? We, we didn't use in Hamburg's course. Maybe it would be smarter. We didn't do it. We, we said we treat patients with multi organ failure. As a gastrologist and intensivist, uh, we said we treat patients with liver failure. And formally, we defined it with bilirubin levels above two uh, and or renal failure. Uh, we mentioned the different opportunities, acute and chronic liver failure, cirrhotics, but also the acute liver failure with the primary and secondary forms, and also patients with pruritus. These are really 
is a terrible problem if you have refractory pruritus, refractory to drug therapy. It's really a, a big problem that can be frequently solved with albumin dialysis. So this is also something that we applied successfully in patients. Um, and importantly, define and re-evaluate repeatedly treatment goals. Treatment goal can be detoxification, reduce the bilirubin levels, reduce uh, uh, uremia. Um, um, you can perform an individualized treatment of acidosis as presented previously beautiful in, in several cases. You can frequently achieve a lung protective ventilation using the Atos device. That's really impressive. It's really uh, in patients with severe AIDS where you really do not know how to ventilate them. Maybe they have a contraindication for ECMO or as persons really want to wean these patients. This is frequently possible to not oxygenate but to decarboxylate these patients successfully. Um, hepatic encephalopathy can be treated, for sure. Albumin dialysis is a proven uh, tool here. And um, um, for sure, you can uh, consider all goals of conventional renal replacement therapy as a potential treatment goal. This is a patient, is an un unhepatic patient who had liver transplantation, primary non function, uh, and was waiting for his new liver. This guy was really sick, it was treated with several extracorporeal devices, the MARSH system is running here, an additional continuous renal replacement therapy was provided, so it was really difficult to even go to the patient and restore blood because there were so many devices all around and you really lost control over the whole thing. Um, in comparison, this is a quite comparable ill patient um, with severe acidosis due to heat stroke, totally multi-organ failure, um, um, that was treated with the Atlas device in a quite comparable, effective way. We could compensate uh, the severe acidosis, uh, we could eliminate toxins, and uh, I'm a fan of an all-in-one device. It's, it's, we have better, better control for, for all the things that's going on there. I think in the future we will focus on more on extracorporeal therapies with an individualized uh, aspect. If I, in 20, what, 29 years, uh, will probably, I hope not, but probably receive, require intensive care treatment for organ failure. Um, I would wish that I receive a treatment with an individualized uh, device, and I think this will remain, it will be an individualized dialysis, uh, form of dialysis device to bridge me to recovery or to a new organ that will be performed maybe by 3D printing or whatever. Yeah? But I think this will be the future individualized therapies with extracorporeal devices as the Atlas provides one. So, let me summarize. Management of multi-organ failure in critical patients is challenging. Extracorporeal therapies are a cornerstone of treatment of patients with multi-organ failure. An early definition of treatment goals and repeated revaluation is of central importance. Most studies focused on advanced dialysis devices in liver failure, and ATROS offers a completely new opportunities in this setting. Um, it offers the modality of a conventional renal replacement therapy and an individualized management of acid-base balance, an individualized temperature control, and also a change of anticoagulation during the treatment, uh, the, during treatment phase. Um, Edmonds, it was showed uh, improvement in, in case series of hemodynamics, reduced the ventilatory support, and provides trends to reduce mortality compared to predicted mortality. However, for sure, this is, this is the first experiences are now collected and we need more. We need randomized control studies comparing different treatment modalities, conventional replacement therapy to these advanced dialysis devices uh, to get more into details. Thank you very much. I thank you very much for the interesting data presentation and also your clear um, opinion and uh, on, on future goals and how to go further on. Any questions from the floor? Yes, please. As so for a removal of CO2, I would say yes. Yeah, the most impressive experience, I haven't, didn't have a, a beautiful case as, as Dr. Rasimus presented it, but uh, was a patient with, after pleural decortication, severe bleeding, and inability to get ventilated. Um, um, so there was no opportunity for ECMO in this patient. The surgeon said, no, we 
could have taken back in the operating theater, we stabilized him with Atos. Yeah, we were able to, to, to decapsulate him to reduce slightly the massive uh, pressure support that was necessary to oxygenate him, so this is possible, as long as you do not need to oxygenate him the patient in addition to conventional me me mechanical ventilation. So this is really possible and as presented previously, I think that my, I wasn't aware so much of this, this uh, issue. The most important thing is for the patient really to achieve a stabilized pH. Yeah, they, they tolerate elevated uh, CO2 levels really well as long as the pH is stabilized. And, and this is the main issue and this is all, not immediately, but within several hours, usually possible to achieve with the Atlas device. Removal of toxins, um, uh, basically it's possible. I, I do, do not have, do, no, I do not have personal experience with, with toxins, with the Atlas device, but there are several reports of albumin dialytes that are able to remove uh, some albumin bound toxins, including copper, and this is quite comparable able with the Atlas device, uh, according to the, the basic principle, that's quite comparable, but I personally do not have an experience with an intoxicated patient. Uh, we, we did it once, yeah, we did it once, um, um, it's possible. <laughs> um, um, we we uh, had a patient with severe rhabdomyolysis and um, uh, after the first ad was uh, clotted, we said maybe this was too much, let's do it in addition and we did it once and, and it worked. If there's an additional benefit, I'm not sure, yeah, but technically it's possible. Yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from clinical experience, the, the, my opinion, most important issue is um, that it's ready to get started if the team is experienced in, let's say, 30 to 50 minutes in this range. Yeah? We worked a lot with the MARS system previously and this was never ever that fast possible. So it takes a little bit longer than conventional renal replacement therapy, but, but if you experienced 30 minutes, and this is, in my opinion, for daily clinical practice, the most, the biggest advantage. For sure, in addition, the advantage is that you have the opportunity to regulate the acid base status in a way that non, no other conventional renal replacement therapy is currently able to, to do. And the mass system is also not able to regulate more than uh, conventional renal replacement therapy in this way. These are the main differences. But regarding albumin dialysis, removal of albumin-bound toxins, in my opinion, is quite comparable. So there are two further questions, quick questions, quick answer, or one. Sorry? Yeah, uh, blood flow rate is between, we started the first time with 100 milliliters per minute, uh, up to 300, depends. And we, we, I, being honest, I cannot tell you the size, a conventional renal replacement dialysis catheter, uh, two, usually two lumen, sometimes three, do, do you know, I don't know the, the size. Yeah, one catheter, only a conventional dialysis catheter, conventional one. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, we, we, time is really up, so. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Both is possible. We, we started uh, in 2015. There was only heparin possible. Then we, uh, and shortly thereafter, citrate was possible. And in the meantime, we are almost only using citrate also in this population, and we have good experiences. Yeah. But both is possible. Yes. Well, there's obviously a vivid discussion, and this is exactly what the symposium should induce. I would like to <clears throat> thank you for coming and listening at uh, home. I would like to thank our two uh, pr presenters for their excellent presentation, and also the company Advitos for enabling this symposium. And uh, I mean, to conclude, we have seen liver failure and CO2 removal are two indications. We have a new device, an integrated 4-in-1 multi-organ support device, the ATVOS system. I think we have seen fascinating and promising data, and obviously there's a new opportunity, uh, and, uh, but we, I think we need um, more evidence, more data in order to transform this innovation into a device uh, within our regular treatment uh, um, uh, 
um, pos possibility. And with this, I want to conclude and uh, wish you a very nice uh, Congress here in Brussels. Thank you.